Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpcc.org or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. Joining me today from Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, the co-chair of emergency medicine, Dr. Sam Torbati. A very good Monday morning to you, Dr. Torbati. Good Monday to you too, Larry. Great to be here with you. Uh, we were last hour talking about Thanksgiving get-togethers and concerns about there being some family or friend group discord over vaccination and the like. I just wanted to hear from you your thoughts about people generally getting together. Do you feel like if everybody is vaccinated, it's pretty much safe to do Thanksgiving as per usual? It's it's much safer than not being vaccinated, that's for sure. Um, with the, the data is so protective it, it's showing us that vaccinated people do so much better compared to unvaccinated. Um, and uh, for patients that are a little bit older, uh, those who qualify for the boosters, making sure that they're, they have their boosters is also important to make sure they, they have the maximal protection. Certainly, as the weather gets colder and as people start to get together more and more, there's more risk, especially with those that are not vaccinated. So we just need to continue our work. And indoors versus outdoors, I know that our family gathering is going to be held outdoors. We're counting on a nice Thanksgiving weather and have moved the time up earlier in the day to uh, to accommodate that. But um, does that make a significant difference? The, the research continues to show that um, outdoors is a little safer and for the most part has to do with better air circulation. So the, the more air we have circulating, the less air that's stagnant, the less opportunity there is for the viral particles to hang out. And um, if somebody does happen to be uh, infected and perhaps not even symptomatic, they're much less likely to infect others when there's good air circulation. So outdoors definitely is better if that's an option. Love to hear of your questions for Dr. Torbati of Cedars. We're at 866-893-KPECC, 866-893-5722. You can also email us at atcomments at kpcc.org. Please include your location as well as your first name. And uh, some folks have been giving, like Orange County and other, you know, or Inland Empire, if you could be a little more specific, that's great, the city or, or community that you're asking. Asking your question from it just adds a nice sense of place. You can also tweet at AirTalk. Please there as well include your location, and you can post on the AirTalk Facebook page. 866-893-KPCC. Beverly and Downey says, I apologize, this question's a little bit specific, and I know Larry uh, prefers more general questions, but I've been having a fever every night for the past five nights from dinner time on. I'm fully vaccinated. I'm boosted. Should I still consider getting a COVID test or could it be something else that's going around? I'm elderly. It's not easy for me to get out to an urgent care center to get a COVID test. Beverly, uh, I, I think I think you should definitely be tested. I mean, uh, one, we need to know what's going on. If, if we know that it's COVID, it gives us better information. But just as important as being tested for COVID, I think you should be evaluated because five days is a long time to have fever, especially if you have any underlying health concerns. So please do your best to make your way out to a doctor so that you can be assessed. Um, Beverly, hope you feel better very soon. 866-893-KPECC. Laura in Los Feliz emailed us, my nine-year-old daughter received her first dose of the vaccine around the time it was approved for kids 5 to 11. She'll be 20 days out from her first shot on Thanksgiving. Her second shot is scheduled the day after Thanksgiving. Do we know what percentage of immunity she'd have at almost three weeks out from the first shot? 
We, uh, we suspect that the immunity should be pretty good. It should be maybe anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. So it's great that she had it. And, um, and after the Thanksgiving holiday, you know, please do get the second and then she'll be good to go. This is wonderful. And would you recommend she take any additional precautions that maybe others fully vaccinated aren't wearing a mask more, something like that? Or would that be overkill? Well, we don't have any great science either way. I mean, certainly if she if she likes a mask and she's around um, other folks that may be at high risk, it's not a bad idea. But is it mandatory? Is it a strong recommendation? I, I wouldn't say that at this point. 866-893-KPECC. Again, you can uh, tweet at AirTalk. Please include your location or email us your question at atcomments at kpcc.org. COVID-related hospitalizations have dropped to 600 in L.A. County, and that might be a head-scratcher to some of our listeners who just last week were hearing us talk about the increasing numbers of cases in L.A. County. So what's your sense of, of what's behind the decline in hospitalizations versus cases? Well, it, it has to do with uh, the vaccine. Uh, we know that the vaccine is, is excellent in preventing people from getting severe disease, and it's excellent in preventing people from landing in the hospital, but it's not quite 100% in preventing transmission. So we may be seeing a fair amount of that where virus activity still persists. So people are getting symptomatic, they're getting tested, they're testing positive, but they're not getting sick enough uh, to land in the hospital. That's really what we want. We want to, to have a, an agent, a vaccine, to prevent people from getting very sick. And that's what we have with our current vaccines. So uh, it's, it, it, it's so important that we continue the conversation and we continue to help everybody understand what the vaccine does and doesn't do and the power of it preventing from uh, preventing people from getting super sick and ending up in hospitals. Dr. Turbati, are we seeing an uptick in people receiving booster doses ahead of Thanksgiving just to help protect themselves? Um, anecdotally, I've heard of people who were looking, you know, for flying to go somewhere for Thanksgiving. And so, uh, you know, uh, making that a priority to get a booster. Are, are we seeing that at a statistical level? I, I hear about it. I haven't seen huge data yet, but I certainly hope it pans out because it, it's it's definitely a good practice. Um, if 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 people are eligible for a booster, they haven't had it, and they plan on being with others around Thanksgiving holiday, and, and as we get into the colder season, now's the time to get it. Uh, I think in general, we've been a little bit disappointed with um, boosters not being. Uh, you know, sought after as much as we were hoping. So we may need to get more of the message out to encourage people to get boosters, get the booster, um, and it'll, it'll help keep you safe. And let's talk with Miranda in Silver Lake. You're on Air Talk. Your question, please. Hi, I am trying to conceive, and I am wondering if it is better to get my booster now or if I should wait until I'm like second trimester. All right. And what are your thoughts about potentially waiting? Would it be because we've heard from some women who've called and wondering about trying to, you know, boost protection to the fetus uh, while they were pregnant? Is that is that what you were thinking or just that it might interfere with with conception? Exactly. I'm, I'm not as worried about it interfering with conception. My thought is more if I would pass on more immunity. If yeah get my booster or like it, you know, I might not get pregnant for six months. Yeah. Good question. Miranda, Dr. Torbani. Miranda, what a, what an incredibly great question you're asking. And I'll be honest, we, we don't have any huge data on that. So, um, you know, at this point, uh, I don't think either is a bad choice and it's possible that as time goes on, that even if you end up getting a booster now, you'll qualify for another booster, you know, in, in six to nine months down the line. So, um, so either one is okay, and uh, and it's it's wonderful that you're thinking about all this and staying as safe as you can. 
And we wish you all the best in conceiving, Miranda. Thank you so much. 866-893-KPECC, or you can email us at atcomments at kpecc.org. Gloria in Pasadena says, uh, we're getting together for Thanksgiving. My seven-year-old son just got vaccinated on Friday. I have twin four-year-old girls who are not vaccinated. I'm wondering what your advice is on approaching uh, the gathering with my twin girls. As far, as far as I know, all the family members, everyone else but the twins will be vaccinated. You know, if, if they're not symptomatic, it's, it's probably a low-risk situation, Gloria. Um, you, you know, it, it, you can enhance the safety in the environment by having good, good aeration and, if possible, having it outdoors. Uh, but just keep an eye on the girls. And if they're not symptomatic, the chances are, are quite low. And there's also other things in terms of perhaps avoiding um, too much close contact if you're, if you're very concerned. But at this point, with the rates being low, with everybody else being vaccinated, this sounds like a, a pretty low-risk environment, much better than last year. Michael in San Dimas says, what data has been gathered regarding mixing and matching of booster shots? I received the J&J vaccine in April. Now I'm being told by some people I should get a booster of one of the mRNA vaccines. That's correct, Michael. There's there's some data that shows that um, patients who get one of the mRNA vaccines after the J&J have a better um, effect in terms of the, the longevity of the protective effects of the vaccine. You, there's certainly nothing wrong with getting another J&J if you're more comfortable with it, but there is some data suggesting that, um, that the protection is stronger if you cross over. All right, 866-893-KPECC or email us at atcomments, kpecc.org. Lynn in Long Beach says, there any new guidance on being around toddlers and babies? I hear all this information about being around older adults and people in general, but what about for those that are very young and ineligible for vaccination? Lynn, we, we don't have any new guidance, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, we need to make sure we take care of our children and, and those who are young. Um, you know, the most important thing is that, you know, we, that we vaccinate ourselves, and as we're protected, um, then we're going to be fine, and uh, making sure we, we keep an eye on the little ones becomes really important, too. All right, 866-893-KPECC. Chris in Larchmont Village emailed us, I was reading today about the surge in Germany. What does that hold for the U.S. this winter? Also, why are we doing worse here in California than in Florida, given our population's generally more uh, willing to mask up and we have a higher rate of vaccination? Chris, you're asking a, gr- a really good question, and it has a little bit of a comp- complicated answer. And you know, right now there, there there's a there's lockdowns happening. There's discussion about Austria imposing a nas- nationwide COVID lockdown altogether for its unvaccinated people, and that you know, in Europe they're dealing with with pretty high rates of COVID, and they're very concerned. In California, we're doing better, but even in California, there's spots where the rates are fairly high and the hospitalizations rates are high. And for the most part, as you look at these areas in in northern and central and and even inland empire, it's the unvaccinated population. So it's, it's the lack of vaccination that's driving a lot of these challenges, both abroad and even within California. And so the, the, the priority now becomes, how do we get people comfortable with the vaccine? How do, we, how do we combat some of the misinformation? How do we bring people around so that we can get a higher vaccination rate? It seems to be a challenge that we're dealing with, not just in California and in the nation, but also internationally. Well, and and the other thing is we have to remember that Florida had a very high case rate for a while. And so you could argue a significant number of Floridians were exposed to COVID and have now some degree 
of protective effect, natural immunity going forward. Not as much, it appears, as from vaccination, but couldn't that be a factor into why Florida is low now? It's sort of the natural ebb and flow as lots of people get infected and then have however many months of of protection that continues after. For sure, Larry. And, and, you know, the issues around this virus and its behavior, it's so complicated. It has to do with, you know, how much virus was recently in the community, how people are acting, what what other safeguards they're putting into place. And so it's possible that, you know, Florida will will have another issue. Um, But for now, the science is very strong in supporting vaccines, vaccines, vaccines to try to get a handle on this disease and to keep people safe. So would your concern if you were a public health official in Florida be that things are looking great now, but once that natural immunity starts waning, you're going to see a big jump? For sure. You you worry about that. And in, in, even in environments where vaccine has occurred, you start worrying about that once it's more than six, nine, 12 months out from the last vaccine. If, if people have not received the booster and we worry that their immunity may be waning, there's risk that there could be outbreaks again. And of course, if there's an outbreak of another variant, then we have another challenge. So for now, we just need to do the best we can to use the best science available to us, get vaccinated, and if we're eligible, get the booster. Uh, We've heard just um, from health officials generally that it seems fewer people are getting flu shots this year. And I don't know whether that's because people got out of practice last year uh, during the pandemic getting a flu shot or or what the reasons for this are. But uh, have you been seeing in the emergency room at Cedars uh, significant numbers of flu cases? No, not yet. We um, flu season has not officially started. I, I am aware of a um, of a single um, flu related death in the county, but formal flu season hasn't started. And it's possible that because last year we were spared of flu season because of everything else that was happening and and people staying indoors and and wearing masks and not being around each other, that people just kind of forgot about the flu. But the flu, uh, you know, remains a, a deadly issue, especially for, for children and older adults. And um, now's the time, you know, to, to get the vaccine. Again, you know, we have, we have two important respiratory viruses that are, one is currently in the community, one that is potentially going to come. And they both have options in terms of managing them through vaccination. So we just need to kind of uh, focus everybody to try to do the best we can to get everybody vaccinated. Hopefully this year's flu shot is as effective as the COVID vaccines. Hopefully uh, we get that kind of, uh, although that's probably unreasonable, right? Flu shots don't don't give that level of protection. No, I, I, I wish we did. <laughs> we, we, Maybe someday. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, hospitals and emergency rooms would be delighted if, if uh, flu vaccines perform the way these mRNA and other COVID vaccines are performing. But uh, different virus, different uh, biology, and unfortunately, the vaccines are not as effective. But just like um, COVID, the flu shot, even if it doesn't prevent you from getting flu, it does make the illness much less severe. Let's see, a question about uh, specific county levels of COVID-19. And um, is that something that you should take into account, Dr. Torbati, is what your county looks like in in the way of cases and hospitalizations to determine the risk reward of of your personal practices? I, I believe that would be wise. I mean, for people who really care about their health and they like to be informed, this information is readily available on the, you know, on the Internet the California Department of Public Health publishes all this information, is readily available. And the variation is pretty significant from one county to the next in terms of the, the uh, positive uh, test rates and also hospitalizations. And as, as you read more about this, you'll see it, it's, it's you know, mostly related to the unvaccinated. So the more unvaccinated members there is in a county, the more the disease becomes an issue. And in those counties where they're struggling, those those hospitals are incredibly overwhelmed because there's there's just so many patients that are that end up being very sick and require hospitalization. 
Bob in Big Bear emailed us, When we look at vaccines for diseases like polio or smallpox, the vaccines prevent us from getting the disease. We don't get a reduced polio response. We just don't catch it. Which, of course, isn't the case with COVID, since we need boosters periodically. Uh, Why is there such a significant difference between the COVID vaccinations and these other historical types? That's a, it's a great question, Bob. It, it, it has to do with the biology of the virus and our immune response. You know, you would think viruses are viruses, but they're not. Uh, viruses are all very different. Their genetic makeup is very different. Um, our, uh, how our body responds, how our immune system responds is, is very different. Some viruses mutate more readily than others. Some don't mutate much at all. So um, the, the science of, of vaccines has continuously evolved, you know, this century, and it'll continue to evolve. We're just we're we're just blessed by having these this mRNA vaccines and the other ones, the even the Johnson and Johnson, be so effective against COVID. Uh, it, it's possible things could have gone a very different way, but for now, we'll, we'll take this this good good bit of luck. Today is the deadline for L.A. Unified employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Those who aren't uh, face possible termination. We don't have word yet on uh, what the figures are on this day of of um, of the deadline. Back in October, the district reported 99 percent of district administrators and 99 percent of classroom teachers had loaded their vaccination status into the district's daily pass reporting system. 97 percent of classified supervisors have done so and 97 percent of all district employees. So we'll see what uh, comes out of that. But um, it's looking, at least in L.A. Unified, Dr. Turbati, like uh, there's a very high rate of compliance with vaccination. You know, the incentives are aligned. You know, teachers want to teach. Students, you know, want to learn. And it and it makes sense because we know that, um, you know, children and, and teenagers can transmit um, and they can be asymptomatic. So it's in everyone's best interest to have a high compliance with the vaccine so the teachers are protected so that they can they can stay healthy and they can continue to come and teach and, and do their life's passion. It's, it's wonderful to see this. We have uh, Linda and Chatsworth emailed us, our church has been cautious about COVID safety and only recently reopened, requiring vaccinations, masking and distancing, as well as not allowing singing indoors. How much risk would there be to allow vaccinated people to sing indoors, uh, fully masked and distanced? You know, it's hard to put a number on it. And, uh, you know, it does look like uh, churches and different organizations have, you know, some some degree of variability in terms of how strict they want to be. Um, <clears throat> and it's the leadership of those organizations who are sort of thinking about the risk and making decisions for for their members. So from a science and, and scientific standpoint, the risk is low. Again, it's not zero. So if you want to make it zero or as close to zero as possible, then these additional um, interventions and, and, and such, you know, could help. Uh, whether it's needed or not, that's a, that's a sort of a, a, a discussion for, for the church and the organizations to have internally. Uh, before I let you go, I uh, did want to ask you quickly about antiviral pills that have been developed to fight COVID-19. And some have said this may be our penicillin moment for being able to effectively treat COVID. What, what do you think? Is, is, are, are, are we seeing strong enough results from these antivirals? You know, the information is, is very early, but um, you know, information from uh, Merck's product and Pfizer's product, are they look to be pretty promising. Again, we haven't seen the data because it hasn't gone through the process of their, uh, their uh, scientific data being published and being visible to the scientific community. The preliminary data looks very strong, especially for the uh, Pfizer um, product, reducing uh, hospitalization and death rates by uh, 89%. 
Uh, we, we just we do hope that this pans out. We do hope that we have more tools to be able to offer patients uh, for those who have both breakthrough uh, infections and those with primary infections. And, um, you know, this is, it's wonderful. Is it a penicillin moment? I don't know quite yet. Um, it would be lovely if it was, but I think time will tell. We'll know in the next two to four weeks. Well, and you'd be right there on the front lines, right? Because often people would be getting this in emergency rooms. That's correct. Uh-huh. I mean, if uh, it works uh, or it, the, the design of these products is if you have early disease within the last three to five, within the first three to five days of symptom onset, if you start it early, yeah. it can reduce your risk of getting sicker. I thank you, Dr. Sam Torbati of Cedars Sinai Medical Center. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in LA. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.